Today on The Grave Talks, Investigation of the Dead, a conversation with Joe Nelson. From a young age, Joe Nelson was intrigued by the idea of investigating the paranormal. After a move to South Carolina and a deep dive into its history, Joe soon wanted to dig deeper into the stories of the undead. This would lead him to put together his own paranormal team and begin this quest. From infamous jails to private residential homes, Joe has experienced all kinds of supernatural activity. This is his story today on The Grave Talks. It probably started off with history. As a young child, I used I used to enjoy reading um, history and then finding out there's ghost stories connected to history to locations and that's where it kind of started i enjoyed learning about it and i never had any personal experiences growing up it probably wasn't until probably the mid-2000s when ghost hunters came out and i realized there's people out there that do this they look for paranormal activity Mm -hmm. and that's where it kind of got to me was the fact that I could actually go out there and communicate with something that's paranormal, something that's unexplained, something that, you know, happens, but yet we don't even notice it in mainstream life. Mm -hmm. So getting out there and doing EVP work and doing, using different um, equipment whether it be Rempide, K2, just different pieces of equipment and being able to communicate with something that's unseen is what really drew me to learning more about the paranormal and, you know, eventually starting my own team probably back in 2013 where we have investigated several different locations, historical being in South Carolina, it's nice to know we have such a rich history with Revolutionary War field, uh, battlefields and Civil War battlefields. And the Southern Bell, just these old houses that are built back in the 1700s, 1800s, and everything that's, that could be connected to it historically and paranormally let's uh, take a step back and i want to talk about your investigating and all that as we we move along the conversation but let's go back to your initial interest uh in the paranormal and your connection to history what were some of the locations initially that you wanted to dig into years before investigating uh you know professionally or anything like that just as a child or as a teenager what were some of those places that fascinated you that you knew had ghost stories attached to them that you would begin to dig into the the lore and the the history of? Well, I actually did not move to South Carolina until I was 15. I actually grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Okay. And knowing about old uh, West and those areas and just the thought of Alcatraz and what could have happened there and the people that went through there. And, you know, as a kid, I saw the movie Alcatraz with, um, with Clint Eastwood and just that, and then reading and studying about it, you know, it really got me interested. And then, and, my freshman year of high school in California, I had such a great history teacher and he had actually brought in some Civil War um, memorabilia, some swords, some um, different muskets and all this kind of stuff. And that's all it took. Mm -hmm. That's all it took. And then moving out to South Carolina, it was just such a big thing. I mean, my love for history grew and grew and knowing the the lives that were lost, the fighting these wars and then what could be remaining there, what kind of residual 
um, energy could be there, what kind of intelligent things can be there. And so I got to the point that I started thinking about this and thinking about this. And I finally got into my ex-wife, her brother-in-law had actually bought a house back in probably about 2009. And it was built in 1823. And so, you know, he was kind of, he he's a skeptic, but he was like, go ahead and go on in there and do your ghost stuff if you want. Because apparently the previous owners had told him there were spirits that were there. Mm-hmm. So we went in and um, ran some EVP sessions and stuff like that. It was just me and my ex-wife. And... At the time, I was an over-the-road truck driver. So I ended up going to work and just, you know, thinking about uh, this tape, this recording I took, I decided to listen to it. And I'm laying in my bunk in my truck at the time and lights are off, curtains are closed, and I hear my voice and hear my voice nothing unusual and then i hear a little girl go mommy and tony i could tell you i i felt like i was going to swing at the air i just had goosebumps i had i was just it really scared me yeah because i didn't know what i just heard and it sounded like it was right there with me of course i have headphones on Mm -hmm. but I couldn't stop listening to it. I would replay and replay. And it was so intriguing. Why is this little girl here? You know, why is she stuck here? Why is she saying, mommy, who is she? And so my intrigue just grew to wanting to know more about history, about locations, what deaths took place so I could figure out who I may be communicating with and if there's a way, if they're trapped, how can I help them? So that's where it really came into where I really took off wanting to know the paranormal. And it was kind of like some people say, you know, once you get a tattoo, you're going to always want to get another one. Mm-hmm. Well, it was kind of like that. Once I ran into that situation with that EVP of mommy, my intrigue with the paranormal really took off so from there i started getting more and more equipment i started we started doing some residential some more historical locations and like i said it was then it was at that time it was me and my friend will that did most of the investigating um and then it got to the point to where we were had so much going on. I started um, bringing on people as team members. So as you're, you're having this experience and you're hearing the little girl make her, her statement of mommy, or so we think it's a little girl. What exactly is going through your mind? Are you thinking definitely little girl? Are you, are you, are you questioning what may be going on here? Are you, are you confident it's a little girl? I mean, what what is going through your mind? The fact that this is on the tape and you know damn well there wasn't a little girl there. That's a lot to comprehend. I mean, initially, what's going through your mind at that point? Honestly, I didn't know what to think at that time. I was just so beyond myself trying to um, think what could be going on. Mm-hmm. I never got a chance to go back in there and investigate again um, because at that time they had ended up moving into the house. Um, when I investigated, it was actually the day they had closed on the house. Um, I never heard of them, them having any more incidences or having any paranormal activity. I would ask all the time, but. Uh, At the time, my ex-wife had asked me not to tell them what we had caught, so I just kept it to myself. So I don't know what happened with all that, but for me, it was just intriguing. I couldn't comprehend it at first, and trying to figure out, okay, 
what I just saw or heard, I see it on TV all the time. Mm -hmm. It's definitely, definitely real. And then that's when it became an adrenaline rush. And when you go out there for investigations and you might do a, uh, a short little EVP session and listen to it right there and you're catching stuff, it it's like an adrenaline, adrenaline rush. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's hard to explain. Sure. So you, you go into this, you have this experience. It, it, what is, is going into your mind when you're starting to think, Okay, I want to I want to take this further. Is it what's your quest here? Is it to find evidence? Is it to to try and and help the spirits? Are you thinking that you need to intervene? Do they even need any sort of intervention? What's what's kind of the initial thought process? Well, when I go into investigation, um either it be historical, they're pretty much wanting to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Could it be paranormal activity or not? And that's the same with the residential. We go in there, we try to figure out what's going on. Um, we try to debunk what we can, but I am going in there trying to find some kind of activity. If um, something's going on that I don't, that doesn't seem right, Mm -hmm. During an investigation, either it be a knock, I may see what could be causing that knock. If I can't see what's causing that knock, then, you know, I chalk it as possible paranormal. Mm -hmm. um, I like to get as much evidence as I can uh, because the more evidence, the more the client is liable not to say, okay, well, it could be this or it could be that because some res um, residents don't want to think something like that's going on in their house. Sure. So I go in there trying to prove that there is something going on or not going on. Um, I just let the evidence speak for itself mm -hmm. really and truly. If I've got several EVPs and during those EVPs, we have hits on a K2 or on another piece of equipment at the same time. Well, to me, that's kind of hard to disprove right there when you're having EVPs of a person in a room when you could be the only person in that room, yet you may be having the KT, K2 going off while the EVP is happening. It's kind of hard to disprove. So I like things like that. And I know that may have been a little confusing there, and I apologize. <laughs> it's fine. Let me uh, ask you about w when you got to South Carolina and you started doing some you know, investigating and started looking into it. What were some of the areas that really stood out to you that went onto your list of going, I want to explore this place? Well, I've, let's see, I've been here since I was 15 and I didn't sure. start doing this until I was um, a little bit after my 30s. Uh, but I could tell you some of my places I really definitely wanted to go to uh, was Ch Old Charleston City Jail. Mm -hmm. It is a beautiful, beautiful building built back early 1800s. And the things that have happened there is just horrifying. You know, they they had hangings there. You know, they report when you go on the tours that there's over 14,000 deaths that took place there. Well, yeah, why don't, and, you, why don't you talk to, to the history of it a little bit before we talk about some of the experiences that you've had there. What Give us the, the history of the jail from, from what you know. And obviously, you talked about hangings and some of the, the greatest hits if you will of things that have happened but give us some of the background what was life like there you know prior to it you know being what it is today okay well the charleston city jail is nothing but a stone building it, it well i can't say it's stone it's it's made constructed but it is it pretty much is cement all the way around they Back in the day, back in the 1800s, they did not have windows um, that were protected. They had 
um, where air can get in, I guess you can say window ways, but they had nothing protecting them from the elements. Mm -hmm. So they were subject to the cold. They were subject to um, the heat with the humidity that could be 120 degrees during the day. They're, they were overpopulated in the sales. Um, you know, if they, I'm just using a, as an example, if they had a cell that could fit 15 people, they would put 30 or plus people in the cell. There was no place for them to go. Um, they had wood sh shavings on the floor. These people would have nothing but a bucket to um, use the bathroom on. Um, diseases were rampant. They tell, they say um, average lifespan was about uh, two months because of all the diseases that were there, wow. all the uh, rodents that were in and out. And if they kind of liked you, you may get a little bit extra special treatment. Um, they would take you as a punishment down to the marketplace and they would whip you and you would have open wounds. They would bring you back to the jail and their theory was let's throw salt on it. Well, of course, we know that's going to be very painful, but then you have these open wounds and you're subject to all these feces that are on the ground and all the bacteria that would get in you, you wouldn't live long. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the most famous people they had there was Lavinia Fisher. Her and her husband were on the Seven Mile Inn. They were said to have... Um, kill travelers. Travelers would come through and they would murder them and rob them. And they ended up getting caught and being put there at the old Charleston City Jail. And back in the day, a woman could not be hung if she was married. So Lavinia Fisher thought she was going to be out of this. Well, they ended up hanging her husband, convicting him for murder her husband, and hanging him. And then that made her a widow. So now she could be hung. Well, the old wise tale says she sat there in her wedding dress, ready to be hung, and said, if you have a message for the devil, give it to me because I'm about to see him. That is the nice little ghost story that goes with it. How much of that is true? There's a lot of debate. Mm -hmm. I've read different stories that say a lot of that is not true. And then you have the people that say it is true. So it's up for debate. But going in there and investigating it my very first time was very odd because I did sit in some of the jail cells. There's actually three levels at that time they only had two levels open so I sat there and on the bottom floor in a cell by myself mm -hmm. now I did have my heart racing because I did not know what was about to happen but I'm sitting there and I notice I hear footsteps outside the door just feet just slide sure. and I kind of looked out the cell. I didn't see anyone. Now, this was a public investigation. There were other people there. So who knows who was where? So I sit back down and I just got this, un, just this feeling that, you know, I probably don't need to be there, especially alone. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know what, let me go find out where everyone's at. Well, right before that, I hear the footsteps again. And so I ended up finally opening the door, didn't see anyone, started looking around in each room, never saw anyone, and I found out everyone was upstairs. So that was kind of, you know, kind of cool, I would say, for investigators. Sure. That was just... 
you know, something new. I never caught any, any EVPs on that investigation, but I had lots of personal experiences. Of course, you know, personal experiences is just something for yourself almost. You can't pass, you know, pass evidence on of that. Um, we ended up doing a K2 session upstairs and contacting a guard, supposedly a guard whose name was Cedric. And the K2 meter was going off like crazy to intelligent questions. It would be still doing nothing. We would ask, have you had any problems with the uh, prisoners? And it might go off. Mm -hmm. There's just several different questions. And I don't remember because it's been so long since I was there for that one. But it was nice to see intelligent stuff happening. Now, my second return to the Charleston jail, I do remember um, one time listening. I think it was on the Graves Talk about someone that did with the Charleston city jail. Yeah. And it was kind of remarkable because I remember my current wife and I, we were investigating and I kept feeling like something that was, I had shorts on and I told her, I said, it feels like something's like crawling around on my leg hair. It's weird. And you know, we chopped it off to nothing. I checked it with my flashlight. I didn't see anything. No spiders, no, you know, spider webs, anything like that. You know, I wiped them off, make sure there was no dust. And a few minutes later, it would happen again. Well, then I heard your podcast about, um, and I forgot the name of the spirit, but a spirit that would be downstairs that would crawl around and grab legs. So that was really neat to hear that, you know, I was having a problem with feeling something that was like on my legs, but yet, you know, I hear later after that investigation on your, on um, the graves talk that there's a spirit that grabs legs. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing that I liked. Uh, we ended up going into this room that I originally tried to investigate on the first time I was there downstairs um, where I was hearing the feet shuffling out in the hall. So my wife and I were sitting in there and for some reason they ended up putting plywood down on the floor. For what reason? I'm not sure. She and I were sitting there and we're asking if anybody can make themselves known, if anybody was there with us. And at one point, we heard a bang that came from the plywood in front of us. And so we thought that was, you know, interesting. We were like, okay, well, let's go with that line. And we tried to ask a few more questions, and we did not get much after that until I ended up pulling out. I had got a replica of old skeleton keys on a ring that you would see that they might use for locks back sure. in the day. And so I held these keys out. I jingled them. I said, if you want these keys, you better come get them. And as soon as I said that, there was two more big thumps on this wood in front of us. After that, everything quieted down. So we moved to other locations. I think there's a couple other investigators there um, that may have caught one or two things. We had some K2 spikes, some REM pod, and I can't think of any much more. I think there was one, um, one EVP that I did get that was upstairs um, in the old warden's house. As we were walking up, we, I had caught, as soon as we walked in this room, my wife and I, we were just chatting between each other. And in a different voice, you hear a guy that says, I got you. And we 
when I listened, re-listened to it, that's what I heard. And I couldn't figure out what he was pertaining to. So I don't know if it was, we were in someone else's house and he felt like we were breaking in and maybe saying, I got you or what it could be, but it was just a out of the blue EVP. When you have something like that, do you consider yourself a sensitive person where you're able to pick up on things that others are not? Or or do you mainly get, you know, your your signals, your information through an EVP or through some piece of equipment? Or, or do you sense things as, as an individual? I tell you, Tony, I believe everyone has sensitivity. Okay. Now, it's like being a football player. Anybody can throw a football, but not everyone can be a professional football player. Sure. So I believe some people have that sensitivity where they're in tune to it from a young age. And just like the movie Sixth Sense, I see dead people. Um, when I've got into some places, some locations, uh, there is a basement in a house that a historical house built back in, oh geez, I think in the 1820s that we investigated, uh, numerous of times, there's always one spot in the basement that as soon as I go to walk through the threshold, it feels like it's a very thick the air is very thick and like i shouldn't be there so usually i'll take a step back i'll take a deep breath and i'll walk forward Mm -hmm. um i don't consider myself as sensitive as mediums and things like that but i have sensed where the energy is different and where i can walk into a location investigate and nothing be happening for hours Mm -hmm. hours and walk in and go okay something's changed it's 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 about to get busy and it does now is that a lucky guess i don't know i try not to look into sensitivity too much um and if i do i try to ignore it because if i'm sitting in a room just like I mentioned the old Charles City Jail the first time, and I felt uneasy. I left. Now, if I ignored that little feeling, could something have attacked me? Possibly. Could I have got more evidence? Possibly. So it's unknown. I tried to channel it out because I don't want it to persuade me as an investigator of what i'm there to do if it's a residential and i feel uneasy well i'm there for a reason i'm there to find out if this house is haunted or not if i feel a little uneasy i don't need to walk away and be done i might need to take walk out and take a uh, break but i try not to go into being sensitive too much and i know there's a lot of people that are uh, my wife tends to be, she can pick up on things, which I like. Um, we have a medium on our team and she's dead on with a lot of history stuff. Um, I can know all the history about this location. She can know, know nothing about where we're going, nothing about this location. And she's pretty much to the T on with the, um, history but once we get that down and we i'll ask her to turn it off because i don't want that to persuade or change the investigation of what we're trying to do that's going to wrap up the first part of our conversation with joe in part two has joe ever encountered anything evil on his investigations what does joe think people or why does joe think people jump to the conclusion that something is demonic so quickly Is there ever a time where Joe said that the haunting he was investigating was too intense to take on? And what are some of the most likely things someone can do to make their home haunted? Until next time for The Grave Talks, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening.